Hello guys, Colin here. Is this a valve or a tube? Well, that largely comes down to what side of the pond you are on. Those of us like myself who are from the British Isles call this a valve, or to give it its full name, a thermionic valve. Anyone who resides across the water in that ex-imperial British conquest, or as you now call it the USA, refer to this as a tube. Sorry, accent. <coughs> tube. Never was there more a perfect example of the difference between British and American naming conventions than this. We call it a valve because that describes its operation without ambiguity. You call it a tube because that's what it looks like. Of course, the matter of which it should be called can easily be resolved by finding out who invented it and what they called it. So settle in for a little history lesson. While the American Edison had been messing around with vacuums and glass tubes for a while, he failed to recognise their potential for anything other than illumination, leaving the field wide open for items like this to be created elsewhere. The item and term were invented and coined in 1904 by English physicist John Ambrose Fleming, whose first valve consisted of only a cathode and anode in vacuum. It was often referred to as the Fleming diode, as it only allowed current to flow in one direction and was used for rectifying radio signals. Fleming named his invention the thermionic valve for its similar operation to a fluid or gas valve. Thermionic emission is when a material is heated to the point where ionised charge carriers, like electrons, can flow from its surface. Once the potential energy barrier has been overcome, ionisation occurs, allowing electrons to free themselves from their host atoms and launch themselves into the void. Within a valve, the electrons emitted from the cathode are accelerated through vacuum towards the anode, and so we get a flow of current through the valve, in a similar way as we get a flow of fluid through a fluid valve. The Fleming diode, however, could only be used for signal rectification. It had no way to amplify a signal. That changed in 1907 when the DeForest triode gave rise to the first valve that could amplify. The critical inclusion was a third electrode, hence the name triode, that functioned as a control grid. By placing the control grid between the anode and cathode, you could control the current flow through the valve when a signal was applied to the grid. In 1926, tetrode valves with a screen grid placed between the control grid and anode were invented, stabilising the valve against oscillations and reducing control grid capacitance to zero. Improved, but not perfect, these valves suffered from secondary electron emission. Essentially, when an electron strikes the anode, it does so with enough energy to ionise the anode and allow it to also emit electrons. In a triode valve, this isn't an issue, as the secondary emission electrons are simply recaptured by the plate. But in a tetrode, those electrons can be captured by the screen grid, robbing the anode of current and reducing the amplification of the valve. When plotted on a graph, the tetrode kink in the performance is visible. In 1929, a further suppressor grid was added, solving these issues and creating the first pentode valves. That wasn't the only innovation. Indirect heating of the cathode allowed these valves to be powered from AC, rather than needing a dedicated DC battery to power the heaters, which previous valves required. This gave rise to many of the valves that we still use today, such as the EL84 and EL34. Mullard Phillips held the patent for pentode valves and critically their suppressor grid, so for other companies to compete in the market, they needed a different solution to combat secondary emission. UK engineers at EMI in 1932 overcame this patent issue with their own alternative design. Enter the Beam Tetrode, which solves the issues with conventional tetrodes to operate on par with pentode valves but without the need for an additional grid. Instead, they use clever geometry of beam-forming plates to focus the electron flow into a narrow beam that strikes a small area on the anode, minimising secondary emission to the point where it becomes a non-issue. The 6L6 is one such beam tetrode still in use today. Since these are tetrodes that lack the kink in their response characteristics, beam tetrodes are often referred to by their family label, KT, standing for kinkless tetrode. KT66 and KT88, widely regarded as the best quality audio valves, are named such for this reason. Of course, nothing lasts forever. In 1949, the transistor was invented. Transistors were smaller, more reliable, more durable, and consumed less power than their valve counterparts, and sparked a revolution in electronics. 
By the mid-60s, valves were rapidly being replaced by cheaper solid-state devices, all but wiping out the valve industry that had been going strong for decades. From hundreds of factories across the world, now the only places still left making valves can be counted on one hand. Today, valves are only used in niche specialist environments. Guitar amplifiers are one of the very few areas that still cling to this archaic and outdated technology, as they provide a feel and performance that many think transistors have never managed to replicate, and some hope never will. One day we may see our valves gone for good. When technology gets better and attitudes change, all our valve amps may end up as nothing more than museum pieces. A reminder of times long forgotten when we used to amplify signals by heating metal elements inside little glass tubes. But until that day, whether we call them vacuum tubes or thermionic valves, let's celebrate this wonderful technology by turning it up and rocking out. And if you've liked this video and you want to see more content from me, then you can hit that subscribe button that will notify you of all new content as it comes out. My Patreon's also there for exclusive secret stuff. If you wish to support me further, t-shirts are available if you want to grab one, and there's other videos you might not have seen. But that's all for now, guys. Keep it loud, and I'll see you later. Geez, a break with that tube, Potter.